So thank you for having me here. And, uh, it's nice chatting to people. So if I understand correctly, uh, you know, I'm going to be filmed. And if I also understand correctly from the notes on the door, I, I might want to stand in the back of the room if I don't want to be filmed, right? So, so, but uh, hi, Mom, just in case. Um, so I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, work that um, uh, is basically sort of a second PhD that I did in, uh, in Northwestern, where we set up um, a group to do um, LIGO data analysis, but not uh, LIGO data analysis like most people are working on at LIGO. Uh, this is sort of a post-processing uh, analysis. So many people are working on finding uh, signals in the noise, and uh, what we do comes after that. Once a signal has been found, um, we follow it up and try to find um, parameters of binary and spirals, basically. So that's why I call it uh, gravitational wave astronomy. Uh, and to my horror, when I arrived uh, on Monday, I found posters on the or next to the elevators um, saying that Duncan Brown, uh, last week, last Friday, had, had given a talk with the exact same title. But uh, I, I asked for a PDF version of his talk, and uh, there isn't too much overlap. But I'll skip the, the introduction a bit, I suppose. Um, so this is work that I uh, have been doing at Northwestern, where I was before as a postdoc. Um, as I said, we basically started a group that does uh, uh, LIGO data analysis. Um, much of the work has been done, being done by Vivien Raymond, who is a, who is a grad student now. Uh, he, he finished his undergrad at Northwestern, and now his project is about uh, exactly this work. Uh, Ilya Mondel and uh, Fiki Kalogera, who is the PI of this little group. But we're also working with other people, statisticians like Christian Rover, who is in Hanover in Germany. Um, uh, Nelson Christensen, who is in... Um, uh, Minnesota, and Alberto Fecchio, who is in uh, Birmingham, the UK. And just for people you know, who can't remember the date, I usually put the date in the bottom of my title page. So um, what does my talk look like? Uh, I'll give you a brief introduction about gravitational waves, uh, just to remind you in case you missed Duncan's talk. Um, I'll mention uh, Ligon Virgo, of course. Um, I'll tell you something about complex binary coalescences because that's what we work on. LIGO uh, can observe, in principle, uh, more things, but we're interested in binary stars consisting of black holes and neutron stars that uh, coalesce. Um, what we do is, as I said, after the detection has been made, we do parameter estimation and we use Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, to, to establish that. I'll tell you a little bit how that works. Um, and um, I'll show you some results uh, of the actual estimation of astrophysical parameters. Now, as you know, obviously, um, LIGO hasn't detected anything yet. Um, so all this work is sort of, you know, awaiting a first detection. And it sounds a little bit silly from, uh, from time to time to me as well, because basically what we do, as, as you'll see, is we create a signal ourselves, and then we estimate its parameters, right? Um, but that gives us a, a handle on how well we're doing, obviously, because we know what the parameters are. And also, we need to prepare these codes for the case uh, uh, a detection event occurs, uh, which could be any day now. So a brief introduction, gravitational waves. Um, uh, they're called ripples in space-time, they're predicted by Einstein, and so far they've only been observed indirectly um, uh, in the Hulse-Taylor binary pulse, for example, um, but to, you know, ex astonishing uh, extent. So here you see um, a mass A, mass B uh, plot. Uh, the orange part of the plot is uh, unphysical, uh, whereas sinai is larger than one, and so there's only this small region of the, of the uh, plot where physical uh, solutions are possible, and if we zoom in into this uh, small point here, uh, which is this blow up here, then you see there's a very, very narrow range in uh, both masses for which all of these parameters uh, match. So it's sine i that matches q is the mass ratio here, the, the, that's this, this range here. Um, gamma is uh, uh, the uh, time dilation. Um, S is, I think, the Shapiro delay or Shapiro shape or something like that. Uh, omega dot is the uh, perihelion precession. This is the orbital decay, P dot. And so all those uh, different parameters match extremely well with this observation. And so, you know, there's very little doubt 
that um, gravitational waves exist. Um, the only thing is we, sh we can't detect them directly yet, but we're very close. So gravitational waves are very different from electromagnetic waves, which we're all used to, um, who, uh, uh, waves that actually move through space-time, whereas uh, uh, gravitational waves do are ripples in the metric of space-time. Um, so they're not in, in the space-time, uh, but, but actually change the space-time itself. Um, the way they're produced are very different. Uh, in the case of electromagnetic magnetic radiation, it's uh, a, a large group of uh, atoms that emit radiation incoherently, whereas uh, gravitational waves are produced coherently by you know, a small number of very massive bodies. Um, EM waves have relatively short um, wavelengths for gravitational waves that's relatively long. Uh, the EM force, of course, is very strong, whereas gravitational force is very weak. Uh, the frequency ranges are quite different. Um, and finally, in case of uh, EM radiation, we actually measure the energy of the photons. Whereas in uh, case, and there's some corner missing here, I don't exactly understand why, but there's some miscommunication between the projector and my laptop, apparently. Um, but in the case of um, uh, gravitational waves, we'll actually measure amplitudes. And so there is a difference how the luminosity drops as a function of distance. If you measure energy, it's 1 over r squared. And if you measure uh, amplitude, it will be 1 over r. So why would we like to detect them in the first place? Um, well, you know, I don't really have to ask you that, but, uh, or explain to you that, but uh, just in case. Um, obviously, we'd like to directly measure these gravitational waves now that we know they really exist and we pretty much know what they look like. Um, it would be very nice to observe black holes directly uh, for physicists. Um, some more confirmation of Einstein's theory. Um, Gravitational waves are supposed to travel at the speed of light, which means that there's no mass of the graviton. And um, the other thing is that uh, gravitational waves are supposed to act transversely on their direction of uh, propagation, which uh, is, in other words, which means that uh, the graviton spin equals uh, 2. For astrophysics, um, there are many reasons as well, obviously. Um, so far, we've been looking at the universe mostly in electromagnetic radiation, uh, somewhat in neutrinos and uh, um, maybe uh, cosmic rays or something. Um, but this will add a fourth big new window. We'll be able to see things that we've never been able to see before, simply uh, because we're looking with an entirely different kind of information. <coughs> um, the things that we will observe uh, are things like uh, neutron stars are coalescing and uh, being ripped apart in the process. So it tells, tells a little bit about the equation of state of, of neutron stars. Um, same happens for uh, black hole neutron star binaries that coalesce. The, the black hole will eventually swallow, swallow the, the neutron star. We'll look at black hole black hole collisions, which might very well have no electromagnetic uh, counterpart whatsoever. Um, so it would be completely new events um, to look at. A uh, core collapse supernovae, in principle, we'll be able to look directly into the core of a supernova, just as we do in neutrinos, um, but hopefully with a little bit more uh, information. Um, and the people who are trying to observe primordial gravitational waves that might teach us something about uh, the Big Bang. I didn't include pulsars in this list. If, if a pulsar is a hill, you might be able to observe it. Um, and it will tell us something about uh, how stiff the equation of state of a neutron star is. And of, obviously, there's, you know, probably more to come that we didn't expect. So very briefly, because I th suppose um, some people in the audience are much better at GR than I am. Um, Einstein's theory basically tells us that uh, matter and energy tells space-time how to curve. And once space-time is curved, space-time tells matter and energy how to move. Right? That, is, uh, that is basically what it comes down to. Um, uh, very quickly, you could uh, write um, uh, Einstein's equations as uh, a flat Minkowski metric plus some perturbation on that. And if you do that and you play a little bit with uh, the variables, you make some assumptions like uh, the, the weak field limit. Uh, you assume there's uh, only 
linear components in h bar here, then you uh, can write uh, this stuff as a wave equation, and if there's vacuum, there's no sources of um, matter, sources of gravity, no matter, no energy, um, you get a homogeneous wave equation here, which has a solution that looks like this. Uh, I left out some rows and columns here. Uh, and basically what this tells you is that um, there are two polarizations in the gravitational waves, one that we call plus and one that we uh, call cross, and I'll show you later what exactly that means. Since we've been assuming um, uh, g equals c equals 1 here, um, the, the velocity of the, of the waves from this, this equation uh, uh, is 1, which means that it's uh, uh, the speed of light. And uh, as I said before, the, the magnitude of the, the amplitude that we measure drops up, off as 1 over r uh, as you go far away from the source. So to summarize, what do they look like? Um, I mentioned most of this before, they propagate tr transversely, um, and in doing so, they uh, squeeze space-time, and that is what you see here. Uh, this depicts the two polarizations, plus here, cross there, um, and, um, and basically it's this amplitude, so the, the difference between th this distance, basically, that's what we're trying to measure, right? Um, and we do that as a, a quantity that's called the strain here, which is a time variable. Uh, it contains the plus and the cross polarizations, which are a function of time. Uh, and the F plus and cross are uh, projection functions of the waves onto the detector, which in case of uh, when spins are present, so, so uh, the F plus and cross uh, contain the polarization angle of the source, which means that if uh, spins are present, the whole thing is processing, uh, and this is a function of time as well. So what we're trying to measure is uh, dl over l, this uh, quantity here, which is about 10 to, the 20, uh, 10 to the minus 21, 10 to the minus 22 in the case of Liga and Virgo. So this is a very small uh, strain that we're looking for. Now, how do we want to measure uh, such small strains? Um, people, uh, I almost said we build, but uh, clearly other people did that, uh, built very large uh, detectors. This is LIGO in uh, uh, Livingston. Um, in, uh, and, uh, and there's another one in, in uh, Hanford, Washington State, in the desert. And uh, what you see here is some control building and four kilometer long arms. You see one of them completely, the other one in the other direction, which is astonishing long. Uh, they contain a vacuum tube. And basically what you're looking at here is a Michelson interferometer, right? Where you have some laser source, uh, a beam splitter. You, um, you um, let part of the light go through to one mirror. Part of the light is deflected to the other mirror. In the end, everything adds up in a photodetector. Um, and on the photodetector, what you have is a fringe pattern. And if the distance of one of these arms changes, then the fringe pattern is going to change. And so that's how we try to measure uh, changes in the arm length of the LIGO detectors. Um, and with the sort of uh, interesting benefit that if you have a plus, uh, plus uh, polarization wave like this, then you're going to squeeze one arm while you stretch the other. Uh, and so you might actually sort of double your sensitivity there. So at the moment, the detectors that we're using um, uh, is one in uh, Livingston, Louisiana, four kilometers long, this identical one in Hanford, Washington State, uh, which is four, kilometer, uh, four kilometers long as well. There's a smaller one uh, with half the uh, arm length. And usually we don't include that data because it's not uncorrelated from uh, uh, the H1 detector. Um, so we only actually, and, and it's less sensitive, obviously, so we only use data from H2 if H1 is offline during some interesting event. Um, very important is uh, Virgo and Pisa, which is uh, smaller, and uh, the noise curve is not as good yet as LIGO, but they're improving and, and getting closer and closer. Um, but the reason it's important is that um, if you have a third detector, your uh, resolution of sky position becomes much, much better. And especially if you have uh, a third detector that is at some very long distance away from the other two. So the baseline is much longer, which gives you a much better handle on the sky position. I'll show you that later. Interesting news is that uh, Australia is going to build an IGO detector, which is probably going to be five kilometers long. I don't know anything about the time scale, but Western Australia is about uh, the best place to put a, f a fifth, uh, sorry, a fourth detector the fourth site, let's put it that way, um, in order of uh, base length and, um, and sensitivity to sky position. 
So these are huge microscopic interferometers. Uh, at the moment, they have a sensitivity between 40 and 1600 hertz. And the strain that I was talking about um, with an arm length of a few kilometers comes down to uh, a DL of about 10 to the minus 16 centimeters, which is extremely small. <coughs> um, like a Virgo collaboration uh, came off the ground uh, in spring 2007 uh, when uh, Virgo started their first uh, science run and uh, started the data sharing uh, agreement with LIGO, which is important because you want uh, data from as many interferometers uh, and coherently uh, from as many interferometers as possible. Uh, and the working groups, um, obviously the first one uh, uh, is the one I belong to, uh, but the people looking at bursts, uh, for example, supernovae, so these are unmodeled bursts where you don't have a very good waveform, continuous waves of people looking at pulsars, and these uh, guys look at um, primordial gravitational waves, uh, which might tell us something about the Big Bang. So we're sort of the, uh, in a comfortable position because um, the in spiral of uh, two bodies due to gravitational radiation is pretty well understood, and so we, we know our waveforms and we know what we're looking for, whereas all the other groups have, uh, have a disadvantage there. Actually, that's not quite true for continuous waves. So, compact binary coalescences. We're looking at uh, two compa compact objects, uh, either, each one of them either is a neutral star or a black hole, um, that are close enough to coalesce within a Hubble time, let's say. And um, the question is, how many of these things could we see? Uh, well, it depends firstly on the horizon distance. Um, this is for the initial uh, LIGO and Virgo detectors, uh, which were closed down in 2006 and upgraded, and so now we're just starting the enhanced phase. Um, there were some problems with getting the, the right sensitivity, but I think we're slowly getting there, which should, in, should mean that the sensitivity is about twice as good as it was before. Um, and since uh, we're looking at amplitudes and things drop off as one over R, it means we look twice as far and have an eight times higher volume and hence eight times uh, higher uh, um, detection rate. So that's what the, the horizon distances tell you here. Um, the main uncertainty in detection rates is not in how accurate the detector is going to be, but is in how many of these systems are around in the universe in the first place. We don't really know. We don't really know how many black holes are around, for example. So um, there are different estimates, and I only quote the two sort of uh, middle ones. Uh, there are uh, uh, um, extremely optimistic estimates nobody really believes and extremely pessimistic uh, estimates somewhere uh, above this that hopefully isn't true either. Um, but c quoting these numbers and looking at the enhanced detectors, um, you know, we might in the enhanced, during the enhanced phase, we might get uh, about, you know, uh, a detection or two or so. Uh, if we're very lucky, maybe a few. If not, detectors will close down in about two years, I suppose, a you know, year and a half, perhaps, um, uh, they will be upgraded to advanced, which will enhance the um, uh, sensitivity to uh, 10 times better than initial, which means you have a 1,000 times uh, larger volume. And by that time, we should very likely be observing several of these things a day, uh, a, a year, and if we're lucky, you know, once a day or something. <clears throat> Our project, what are we trying to do? Um, so we want to do parameter estimation. And interestingly, when I started, when I first joined LIGO, went to LIGO meetings, people were not very interested in this kind of thing, which was a bit frustrating, actually. Um, you know, everybody was looking hard for, for, for events in the data in the first place. Obviously, it's a very uh, important thing to do. Um, but we're astrophysicists, and so we want to know what we look at, right? We just don't want to just look out and absorb whatever's coming at us. We'd also like to understand what we see. And so that's where we come in. And uh, luckily, in the last three years or so, the attitude at LIGO has changed quite a lot. And Mark of Che Monte Carlo is now a very hot thing to do. Uh, and, and people really want to know uh, what we're looking at. So uh, at least, you know, maybe our presence had some effect. Um, we need to show that we can do Mark of Che Monte Carlo with a large number of parameters. And I'll show you that's not very tri trivial. We have 15 parameters in the, in the general case where we have uh, quasi-circular orbits and a spin on each of the objects. Um, and a 15-dimensional parameter space is relatively hard to search through. So that's, that's uh, what we're trying to do here. 
Um, in the end, when everything works, and it's, it's, uh, it works pretty well, it just takes a very long time at the moment, um, we'd like to automate all this stuff, and that's what we're doing right now, um, so that after a detection has been made and has been confirmed, we can automatically run this code using the information from the search trigger uh, to speed everything up as, as much as possible. Um, and things that we'll find is, uh, you know, whether a, sp a source is spinning or not, and, um, and uh, which is quite interesting in, in the astrophysical context, but also we'll find the physical parameters. Uh, what the trigger will, the search trigger will tell us is two masses, which are usually quite good, and a time of coalescence, uh, but we want to describe the whole binary, which includes, uh, you know, sky position, the distance of the source, even the orientation of the plane of the binary is something we can resolve to some extent, um, things like that, uh, apart from, of course, masses and spins, etc. Um, well, I already mentioned the astrophysical uh, ideas behind it. Basically, the part I'm interested in is especially stellar, binary stellar evolution. Um, and, you know, in order to understand that better, and especially things like common envelopes, um, which are very poorly understood at the moment, uh, this can hopefully contribute at some point anyway. So, what are the signals that we're looking at? And what do LIGA and Virgo see? Um, well, they see about the last 10-ish or so uh, seconds, so maybe 20 seconds for 30 seconds even for a neutral star. A neutral star in spiral uh, and only a couple of seconds for a high mass system. Um, and this is what a typical signal look like, looks like. If there's no spin present at all, uh, you get a normal chirp. Uh, but if there's some spin present, this is in dimension uh, unit of uh, S spin over M square, squared. Um, then you see you get some modulation on top of uh, the chirp, which is produced by the precession of the the orbit of the in spiral during uh, the in spiral during the, the observation. And if you get somewhat larger spin, and this is only 0.5, it's not very extreme yet. You see this modulation is quite severe, which means that there is a lot of extra information in that signal. Um, but as we'll see, it also makes things a lot harder because it becomes a lot harder to walk through parameter space. Uh, this is supposed to be a blow-up of this, but I actually see it's a blow-up of a slightly different waveform, but with the same parameters. So, what, how do we do our gain? Um, as I said before, we're practicing, right? And so what we typically do is we take some noise um, usually it's, it's Gaussian noise, so it's simulated noise uh, based on the, um, the, the noise curve from the detectors, uh, and uh, rather than LIGO Virgo data, if we want to publish a paper. Um, because once you get your hands on LIGO data and you use it, it becomes very, very hard to get a paper out. We managed it once to the surprise of some of my co-authors by playing stupid, I think, but uh, um, it's usually very hard to do that. So in, typically we use uh, simulated noise here. Um, you see some of that here. This is the, the detected noise. This is the um, amplitude, um, uh, amplitude spectral density of the noise. And it's, it's sort of hard to compare uh, a, a signal injection. So Sorry, this is in the frequency domain. Um, and it's hard to compare uh, sort of literally, but this is what an injection would look like in the frequency domain. And you see that the amplitude is typically at, at maximum about the order of the, the noise uh, amplitude, um, which suggests that you can't actually measure anything. But remember that this is all coherent, and uh, that is how we can find it back in the first place. So this is an SNR for two detectors of a total SNR of 17. <clears throat> Right, so, so we, we did those tests, um, uh, and, and what we do when we do a simulation is, um, uh, sorry, when we do a simulation, well in any case, but also when we do a simulation on real detected uh, data, for example, either by injecting a signal ourselves, or um, uh, another interesting uh, thing is that uh, people do what, what they call hardware injection. So basically they uh, compute what a waveform should look like and then they take the mirror of the detector and they move it slightly so that the signal gets in at the very heart of the system. Um, and these hardware injections are very useful. So the whole pipeline, they go through the whole pipeline and it's a very valuable test. Um, so we, we do the same thing. And what we do then is that we get a trigger 
because this hardware injection gets detected as if it were a real signal, let's say. Um, and so we get the information from the trigger. Uh, we know where the signal sits, and it's a very good assumption that close to the signal there's nothing else in there, unless you're very unlucky and there's a glitch or something. But in, mo in most cases, the, the, just before and just after the signal, there's just detected noise. And so what we do is we take noise uh, that does not contain any signal, and we use that to estimate the PST, the, the, the power spectral density. Um, and then we don't suffer too much from the fact that we assume it's Gaussian. Actually, we, I'm not even sure we explicitly assume it's Gaussian in that case. Um, and, um, and so we, we did the, the, the test to see how much better or worse we're doing if, if we, we're not using synthetic uh, noise. And for normal SNRs like this, it doesn't matter too much. We get, uh, we get the same results. Um, and maybe slightly smaller accuracy. So uh, if, we, if we look at our um, uh, posterior density plots, then you know they, they look the same, but they're slightly wider. Um, so you have a detection of the errors on the parameters that you infer from that particular waveform don't change very much. That's right. I guess my question is more basically, you know, how does it change the threshold for your, you know, detection? Right, that, that's not what we're concerned with. Uh, that, that is what, what people, um, what most of the people are in the searches are concerned with, um, like Duncan Brown, for example. Um, and they have a whole list of um, possible signals in the data that are not gravitational waves, like you know, earthquakes, slamming doors, sneezing people, uh, passing trucks, stuff like that. And they go through a whole list and prove it's not one of those, or you know, prove it is one of those, and then it drops out. And one other very important test, and that is why LIGO built two detectors, is that you want coincidence between the two detectors to start with, right? If there is a signal, you should be, you should usually measure it in both detectors. And so there's a whole, there are a whole series of tests that are trying to rule out. Um, anything else but a gravitational wave. <clears throat> so hopefully, and that's our assumption, by the time we get uh, the signal, it's sort of been confirmed that this is a gravitational wave and, or, or you know, an injection, but it looks like a gravitational wave. Um, and, and it's a binary in spiral, so then it is actually worth running our code on. Okay, so we inject the signal uh, into some noise, which means we have a data set, an artificial data set. Um, and what we're trying to do is find the parameters. Um, we use a maximum likelihood method. Um, so we compute the likelihood as a function of the data that we have in frequency domain, the model that we have, uh, and weighted by the noise. And, um, and, and, sorry, and for, for a particular uh, set of uh, parameters lambda, a vector of parameters lambda that describes, uh, that describes our model here. Um, this is for one detector. Uh, usually we have m many more detectors and then we simply take the product of the likelihood. Um, so that, that is basically the core of a Markov chain Monte Carlo um, uh, method. You compute the likelihood and then I'll get you quickly through this confusogram uh, and then you keep computing the likelihood and jumping through parameter space. So how do we jump through parameter space? We start with some parameters at lambda 1, compute its likelihood, as I said before, and then what we draw randomly is the jump, yeah, so delta lambda, right? It's a jump size and direction. Um, that is what's random, so it's not a random new point, it's a random jump in size and direction, and then we jump from the place where we are now to some new place that is uh, described by uh, the current lambda plus the delta lambda. We compute the likelihood again, and then the main thing that happens here is we look at uh, the ratio of uh, likelihoods, and we see whether the new likelihood is better than the old one or uh, maybe not as good, but by how, uh, and then we determine by how much. We compare that to some random number, and so uh, between zero and one. If this is larger than the random number, we'll accept the new jump. We accept the jump to the new state. If not, we reject it. And so what happens is if the new likelihood is larger than the old likelihood, we always accept because this is larger than one. Um, if it's if it's smaller than one, then there is some uh, chance that we'll actually still accept it. So sometimes we actually jump to uh, places of low, lower likelihood. And the reason is, is that it, once you arrive at the, the maximum, the absolute maximum of, your, of the, the distribution, you still want to sample around it. So you want to jump down every now and then as well. Is it the uh, Hastings? Yes, this is basically Metropolis Hastings. Uh, 
algorithm. Right. Um, so, yeah, so this is what we call adaptive Markov-Chain Monte Carlo. Um, and surprisingly, maybe at first, is that if you accept, you increase the jump size, whereas if you reject, you uh, lower the jump size. Um, the reason is that if you, if you are on the top of your distribution at the very peak and you're making very small jumps, then you're going to accept all your jumps because you basically you're so much zoomed in on the top that it's the, the space is sort of flat around that. The likelihood space is flat. And so if you keep accepting every next jump because the likelihood is, uh, the ratio of likelihoods is about one, um, then clearly what you need to do is take larger jumps so that you start going down every now and then. Um, so, uh, the changes are, I think, let me see, um, a factor of two or something like that. But what's really important is uh, the ratio between the, the, the size you increase with and the size you decrease with, because that determines your acceptance ratio. So, you change it by factor two every step? I think if we, I, I might just, uh, if we uh, increase, we uh, increase it with a factor of. Let me see. It is every step, yes. Sorry? Yes, apparently this converges to the true posterior distribution. Sorry? So, so in the end, this stuff is self-regulating, right? I mean, you you uh, increase a bit if you if you're going nowhere, and you start decreasing as soon as you start hitting lower likelihoods all the time. So in the end, you e in the end you end up with a fairly constant sigma. Um, what statistician, statisticians tell me is that it's exactly uh, what it's supposed to do. Okay. Okay, maybe, maybe we should talk about this after, afterwards. Okay, let's assume for now it works. Okay, so this determines how we, how we jump through parameter space. Um, so how does it work then? Um, we have a number of parameters. Uh, for example, in this example, I just showed the chirp mass. Um, what we do in every step is uh, compute the, the log likelihood and uh, as, a, as a function of uh, the, the chirp mass parameter. So what you see here is the value of the chirp mass, uh, which indicates how we jump through parameter space. Uh, this is the iteration number, and this is the log likelihood, which starts off rather low, but uh, at some point becomes uh, very high. The different colors are different chains. I think there's four or five chains in this, uh, in this graph. Uh, and I'll show you, I'll play you a movie where we just start at the beginning of the, of the run, and then at some point start uh, collecting uh, points and and what we try to create in the first place in this case uh, is this one-dimensional um, marginalized PDF uh, which is basically a histogram of uh, the points along this axis <clears throat> so as the change run um, as I said before, they, they start at low likelihood. Actually, the, the dotted colored lines here are the, the starting values. So we start at, uh, even if we know uh, the chirp mass, uh, we, we consider the, the value of the chirp mass that we injected as uh, the trigger um, value, but we start offset from that. First of all, uh, because we want to simulate the uncertainty that, that's going to be in, in the trigger value. Secondly, um, we want multiple chains, and I'll show you in the next slide exactly why, to confirm 
Uh, and, and we want them all to converge. And if we would all start them at the same position and do the same things to them, uh, that might not be very convincing. In this case, you see they all end up at the same likelihood. And uh, as we gather more and more information, we build up the PDF here. Uh, and that is, in the end, going to, uh, that is going to be the, the product of our, uh, of our investigation. So one of the big problems with Michael Chain Monte Carlo is how do you determine whether your chain has converged? Um, you might look at the likelihood value, for example. See, that goes up in the beginning and then stays stable for a very long time, but it doesn't guarantee you it couldn't go up even further. Um, also, uh, you never know whether you fully um, um, sampled your whole PDF. And so for that, it, to, to, to solve those problems, basically, what is very useful is to have several independent chains uh, that I uh, showed you before. And uh, in this case, there are, I think there are four. So we see a similar plot to what we saw before. This is the, the log likelihood, which starts again low and very quickly jumps up. And uh, uh, all chains find uh, the same likelihood. So these are fully uh, independent chains. They don't exchange any information. Uh, in principle, exchanging information would be very useful because one chain could help the other chain uh, finding a high likelihood. But we want to do the statistics afterwards, and that, uh, for that case, we need them to be independent. So what you see nicely here is that uh, we start off, again, chirp mass values far off from the true value, just to show that we actually, we're really converging to one value uh, and, and convincing ourselves in that. Uh, the chirp mass is the dominant parameter in, in uh, these waveforms because it determines the frequency evolution of the waveform. Um, and for example, the mass ratio eta is uh, less important, and it takes a, a while longer for it to converge as well. So how do, we, how do we convince ourselves, or try to convince ourselves, uh, ourselves that we have converged? Um, we have multiple chains, and basically what we do is we uh, use this lambda maximum, sorry, the uh, maximum likelihood criterion. So we look at all our four or five chains here. We find a point that is the absolute maximum uh, likelihood point of all those chains. Um, and once we found that value, uh, we start including change only after they've reached a certain value, which is slightly smaller than the absolute maximum uh, likelihood, and it's smaller by the number of uh, parameters, in, in most cases 12 or 15 here, uh, divided by 2, uh, because you can show that the expectation value for the variation of uh, L is about that value. Um, so we include change after, after that, and um, we include the data after the change have converged, uh, not before, because the lambda is, is too small then. Um, so that, that tells us exactly which parts of our Markov chains to uh, include. For example, uh, I think this is the blue chain here, maybe the green chain, I can't see it very well. It reaches uh, a maximum likelihood somewhere here. So probably for that chain from this point on, we actually include all the data points, whereas the red chain clearly hasn't converged yet here and probably converges somewhere here. So for the red chain, we would include all the points starting here. <coughs> It gives us a second uh, handle on, uh, on, on testing whether the whole run has converged or not um, by looking how many of our chains we include in this case. Uh, typically, if we include fewer than 50% of our chains, um, we, we don't tend to believe our results uh, and we'll, we'll qualify the run as not converged. Yes, but it means either, either if the run is still uh, going on, then you can keep going and see if it, if it improves later. So if you, if you do this test early on, uh, right after you start a change, obviously they're not, none of them is going, well, one of them is always converging, but um, none of the others are going to be converged. Sorry, I couldn't understand. I, I seem to have problems understanding what you think. So. Um, yeah. No, we just we just look in our data here and we find the point that is that has the highest likelihood. <clears throat> okay, there's another criterion that I won't bother you with, but basically what it does is compare 
um, variances within the chains to variances between the chains, and it gives you some handle of how well you have sampled all of your parameter space. If this value is close to one, it's usually larger than one. If it's close to one, um, you're sampling very well. Um, if it's large, then that value actually tells you how much wider your PDFs are pro probably going to be by the time you've explored all of your parameter space. Sorry, for which? For? Here, for example. Yeah, so it's completely jumping to their big island. Yeah, yes. So, so the whole idea of convergence is no longer, I mean, if you run these longer, they can just jump to the limit. Yes, but it would have lower likelihood. And so, it's, so in this case, the, the red chain actually jumps from somewhere here to somewhere there because it is a huge improve in uh, likelihood. Well, I don't see how this is a problem. I mean, so, okay, so our red chain, what it's trying to do here is reach high likelihood. Okay. Right. Okay. Um, so, so all it does here is, is increase its likelihood, and that's exactly what it's trying to do. Okay. Um, some of the problems we run into uh, are correlations. If you look at a, a waveform with small spin, waveform with large spin, this is 0.1, 0.8. Uh, you see there's much more structure in the spin. There's also much more structure in the likelihood. And you can see that, for example, by looking at the correlations uh, between some of the parameters. For example, um, spin here, and uh, th this is spin magnitude and the angle between uh, the spin and uh, orbital angular momentum. Um, uh, is, is very strong, obviously, um, between the mass ratio and spin uh, parameters, etc. So th there are very strong correlations uh, in a parameter space. It basi basically means that your parameter space is shaped like many narrow ridges, and it's much harder to walk around on you know, many narrow ridges than in a nice uh, uh, hilly landscape. So what you see here, the red uh, lower triangle is for the, for the highly spinning chain, for a highly spinning waveform. Um, this is for the lowly uh, waveform with small spin. And so, um, and so once you introduce spin, uh, there is more information in there, but it also makes it much harder to walk through parameter space. Um, one way to deal with that is parallel tempering. Basically, what you do is for each of the chains that I showed you before, we're not really, using, we're not really running only one chain. We have for each of those individual chains or, or independent chains, each of those consists of about, typically we use five, um, different parallel chains that do actually communicate with each other, but we only show the result for one of them. Each of those chains has what we call a different temperature. The usual Markov chain has a temperature of one, uh, and you may have changed with larger temperature. And the temperature basically changes how you accept, uh, when, whether you accept uh, your jump proposal or not. It makes it easier to accept uh, a jump to lower uh, likelihood. And so what happens is that the higher temperature chains will uh, jump around in parameter space much more wildly than the lower temperature chains. And that's exactly what you see here. This is the log likelihood. Uh, whole chain uh, finds the, the highest likelihood uh, value in the, uh, of, of all the chains. Um, and as you go to higher and higher temperature, it's easier for the chains to, to jump to lower uh, likelihood. And so you'll find that the chains, uh, those chains are actually sitting at the lower, lower values of the parameter space, which is most of the parameter space. And that's exactly what you see here again for the chirp mass parameter. Um, the, the low temperature chain that sits at... Um, high likelihood, very close to the true value of our signal, uh, doesn't move or hardly moves at all. Um, but you see that the purple and, and the light blue dots here, well, the light blue probably harder to see, but they go all through parameter space and they explore um, regions of lower likelihood. And if they, or wi actually wider range of the parameter space, and if they stumble upon something that's very interesting, they might actually tell the lower temperature chain uh, to look there as well. And so because uh, because these chain, chains are uh, exchanging information, uh, you can bring that information down to the t equals one chain, so that in the end it, it ends up in your uh, statistical data. One other thing is uh, we started, uh, so we're the first group to introduce spins in parameter estimation. Um, and uh, because of all the problems with large parameter space correlation, et cetera, we started off in a simple way by using 1.5 pn 
uh, post-Newtonian approximation waveform, uh, which is which you can actually compute analytically, and so it's very fast. Uh, but still, it has you know the most important aspects of spin in there. Uh, by now, we uh, changed to something more realistic, 3.5 pn, um, and um, slightly so you get slightly more accurate waveforms, which is good because they probably compare better to the waveforms that nature is going to give us. Um, but also. Uh, they contain slightly more information, and uh, what we find is that our uh, parameter estimation accuracies actually go up, uh, typically b if we compare between low and high PN waveforms. So red is low. You see that the distributions, the PDF distributions, are especially for eta, the mass ratio is uh, significantly wider. It's slightly wider for the chirp mass, and so you end up with in individual masses, for example, that are about twice as accurate as with low PN waveforms. So how do we set up a Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, simulation? Um, the promise that we have is chirp mass and eta. Uh, we use the distance. Uh, the time of coalescence and the orbital phase of coalescence, we don't really care about that parameter, but you have to put it into your model in order to get uh, sensible results. The position in the sky, um, the magnitude of the spins, uh, the orientation of the spins, so theta is the angle between um, spin and orbit, and phi is again the phase, which again we're not interested in, but uh, you need to stick it in, and the orientation of the plane of the binary. So this is the inclination angle and the polarization angle. Typically, we have five or more serial chains, so those are the independent chains that don't communicate with each other, and each of those, then again, consists of five-ish or so uh, temperature chains. Um, the length that we need for each chain is a couple of million uh, iterations, and typically we have to discard the first 10 to the 5 or so, uh, a few times 10 to the 5 or so as burn-in. That's the, the part of the chain um, that hasn't reached the, the full likelihood yet. For a 1.5 p.m. waveform, uh, it takes about 10 days to get good results. Uh, each of those chains runs on a single chip. Um, and for 3.5 p.m. waveforms, the CPU time to compute one waveform is much longer, and that's exactly why we started with simple waveforms. So that takes quite a hell of a time. Uh, the model generation, to, to, to generate the signal, you mean? Uh, the data set, you mean? Or Oh, all of all of this CPU by far all of this CPU time is in the in the waveform generation. Um, well, about ten days divided by ten to the seven or something. Ten to minus six days. Whatever that is. <laughs> yeah, well, probably. But so we profiled our code, and all all the CPU time goes in there. Um, for this. Uh, these results that I'll show you next, um, we use a black hole neutron star signal. Um, we use two or three detectors, the two independent LIGO ones and Virgo. The total SNR of the whole thing is 17. Um, our masses are 10 and 1.4 solar masses. The distance, we actually vary the distance to get the SNR right, so the distance varies of the injection varies between 60 and 23 megaparsecs. Um, and we use a range of uh, spin values to see what effect they have. So what do our results look like? Something like this. This is a sl somewhat typical, but uh, uh, not too bad pick of our results uh, either. Um, uh, chirp mass, eta, you see the chirp mass is pretty well determined, uh, about a percent or so. Eta is usually uh, more difficult, um, especially we find uh, some degeneracies between eta and spin parameters, which might actually give you a second, second um, um, bump here, uh, which doesn't show up here, luckily. Uh, it might actually go away if we, this is for low PN waveforms, it might actually go away if we go to uh, more accurate waveforms. The distance, Actually, it is somewhat better than typical. Uh, the time of coalescence we get to uh, down to a few milliseconds or so. Uh, sky position, orientation of the binary, um, and uh, here are the spin parameters. So this is, the, again, the dimensional spin between uh, 0 and 1. Uh, and you see the accuracy we get is about 0.3 here. Uh, let me tell you something about the lines that we show. The black dashed dotted line here is the, the injection uh, value, so that's the, the true value of the software injection that we did. 
the red dashed line here is the median of the distribution. So you, know, you could say your best value, uh, the best value for parameter estimation. And in order to um, quote accuracy, what we typically do is we look at what we call the 95% probability uh, range in each uh, PDF, in each um, a marginalized PDF, and that is basically the, the narrowest range that contains 95% of our points here. So that uh, con con constitutes sort of our two sigma result uh, accuracy. And so what we get here is not only the best value, but also uh, an estimation of the error on that value. This is our sky position. Um, Again, we use uh, two sigma accuracy uh, quoting here. I, I copied the numbers from here because they're quite small. So this is the yellow area that you see here. Um, this is uh, for, uh, again, black hole neutron star binaries um, in the case where no spin is present and we're looking with two detectors. So if you have two detectors from the timing, you get a, a ring in the sky. Uh, but I'll show you next exactly why we don't uh, find a full ring here. Once you introduce spin in your signal uh, and allow to, uh, to search for it, um, the ring breaks up and, uh, and becomes much smaller, so your uh, sky area goes down. And um, if, in this case, we use three detectors, and in that case, obviously, you only have, you, you don't get a ring anymore, you get one or two blobs in the sky. In this case, one of them apparently is ruled out by projection effects. And so we, we end up with a very nice uh, sky position result here. Actually, because of time, I'll probably skip this bit here. Um, okay, so that, that is actually answered in uh, the stuff that I'm trying to skip here. Um, well, to some extent it is. Um, well, first of all, there is, uh, there is the precession of the orbit. And um, the, um, so the orientation of the binary changes. And those orientation parameters are, uh, you can determine them slightly better. And they're strongly correlated with the sky position in many cases. And so that has an influence there. Um, no, from from the timing alone, from the timing alone, um, no, from the timing alone, you you get your sky ring independent of, of whether they spin or not. Um, so this really comes from the projection uh, as well. And so the, the projection of the of the waveform onto the detector has has some say in that as well. It's not extreme. It's not as strong as the timing, but it helps. So that is why, in this case, for example, rather than finding a homogeneous ring, we find a ring basically with gaps in it. Um, That I couldn't tell you. I can. I, I think I, I don't know the numbers by heart. Sort of, no, right. What I what I can tell you is we typically find uh, you know a few five to ten or so precession cycles during the the in spiral part that LIGO detects. I think that is the important information. I mean, is part of this there are some orbital information so it's easier, easier to triangulate the numbers? And that, I mean, if you have a, a, is a spin in the sky position aligned with the normal of the orbit? No, it's not. It has an angle. Okay, so the orbit is in the far right. Yes, and yes. And, and that, and uh, that precession. And it's pretty probed in orbital orientations. During the inspiral. That, that helps you yes. out the favorable ones. Yes. Yes, I, th I think I think that's more or less exactly what's going on. So if you if you have no spin, or at least if you have no precession, so pr probably also for aligned spins, um, the orbit is fixed, and um, uh, and and the fact I, th I think the fact that the orbit actually uh, the the orientation of the orbit moves around a little bit um, gives you a whole range of uh, of. Uh, orientation angles, and so it's easier to to fit a specific to fit specific uh, values to that. I think that is what's happening. Okay, let me skip this anyway. Um, this is not something we should stare at too long, um, and I'll actually quote the typical values uh, later on. But uh, what you see in this case, at least, usually, uh, sorry. So let me explain. This is for two detectors. Let's look at the three detector case only. Uh, we inject always the same signal, except that we change the spins. This is the spin magnitude. This is the angle between uh, S and L. 
uh, 20 degrees or, tw or 55 degrees, and so we have zero spin and three different values for the spin. Um, and so if you go down in this list, you get to stronger and stronger spins. And what you typically see, uh, especially for chirp mass, you determine it slightly better here uh, if there is spin present and there is no or, uh, small spin present. Same for eta. Uh, and as, we, as I showed before, also the sky position, for example, becomes much better uh, determined. The value of spin itself uh, is, is almost... Uh, impossible to determine here, uh, right? One basically means 100%, uh, basically means we don't know, um, but for high spin, it's much more uh, constrained than that. So if you go from a Newton star, Newton star to a black hole, black hole signal, um, things change quite a bit. Uh, first of all, now we're using the 3.5 pn waveform. Uh, the masses are uh, obviously different. Uh, and uh, somewhat higher, but especially I think what is going to be important, although these are new results that uh, they're actually still running, and so I just uh, got them from the cluster, and uh, I, I don't know all the de I don't understand all the details yet, so you have to forgive me uh, for that. Um, but I think what is significant here is that the mass ratio is quite different. The, masses are, the mass ratio here is about 1.5 or, or uh, you know 0.65 or so, um, whereas before it was 0.14. Um, so that makes a big difference. Um, now we have two black holes, and so the difference is, is that we have two spins now. Um, or we can have two spins now. In this case, this is non-spinning, so the injection has no spins in it. Uh, we do the parameter estimation. You see, for example, the chirp mass is not as good as it used to be, and I'll try to explain to you later why, that, why I think that is. Um, this is the spin parameter of the most massive com component, um, which clearly shows it's very low spin, uh, close to zero uh, with some uncertainty on it. The second spin is also zero, but we can't really determine that, probably because, uh, you know, this is a lower mass, the lower mass member of the binary, and so it's harder de to determine. Um, almost same signal, but this time we have spins. Uh, in fact, we have quite some spin. The um, magnitude is rather large, 0 0.9, 0 0.7. The angle between S and L is 10 and 20 degrees in this case, and this, this little uh, block here uh, uh, blocks out the, the distance, which is 75 mega, megaparsecs for this signal, uh, and in total S and R of 15. Um, so now what we see compared to before, uh, actually the, the uncertainty in the chirp mass is larger than before, and uh, not smaller. Again, I'll try to explain uh, uh, later why that is. You see the dash dotted line shows the true value of the spin here, and though the, the PDF indicates that we probably have to deal with large, deal with large spin here, uh, the uncertainty is rather large again, uh, simply because we look at a 95% probability, and so it's not as convincing as we saw before. This one actually somewhat seems to do somewhat better. The uncertainty is somewhat smaller, even though it's the, uh, the smaller uh, object of the two. Now that we have um, three detectors, uh, we're actually doing quite a lot better in uh, sky localization. Uh, the, the SNR is somewhat smaller than before, right? It was 17, now it's 15. But even, uh, even uh, despite that, we, we find about 25 square degrees. So this is a blob of um, you know, three de less than three degrees in diameter in the sky. Uh, so it's really small. Um, um, this. Yes, exactly. So uh, the, the symbol here shows where the true position is. That's where we injected it. Um, there is uh, a second uh, position here. and Basically, the plane of the three detectors lies somewhere here. So you get uh, the, the timing is the same for the, for the mirrored case, right? Um, this does contribute, and that's a little bit of a nuisance. Um, I suppose if, sorry, if you go back and you look actually at the... Um, um, the right ascension here, for example, you see this huge peak where the big blob is, and this is almost indiscernible uh, small peak here uh, where the second blob is. So it does contribute, and it's, it's annoying that it's somewhere at the other, the other end of the sky, but uh, if we wanted to tell people where to look, obviously we tell them to look here, not there. And the same is here for the, the declination, by the way. <coughs> um... So one of my last uh, uh, pictures here is uh, why is it important to have spins? Uh, and that is what we, exactly what we're trying to point out with these, this grid of runs. So what we did is uh, inject 
the similar signal all the time, but change the amount of spin that's in the signal, and then do parameter estimation, either allowing or not allowing for uh, spins. Uh, in fact, allowing for zero, one, or two spins. Um, and this is a combination of some of the results I've, sh I've been showing before. This is the result I, we looked at just before. Uh, so again, this is chirp mass. This is the distribution that we find if we allow for spins. This is the value that we injected. And so we see, despite the fact that there is, you know, the, the, the PDF is somewhat wider than I'd rather have it, um, we do uh, recover the, the value of the injection and we do find uh, what the value is with some uncertainty. So this is where we allow the template uh, for s uh, allow the template to adjust for spins. If we take the same signal, so the signal is still spinning, but now we do parameter estimation, we don't allow for spin, and basically we tell uh, the code vault there is no spin in this signal. Um, then what happens for the chirp mass is th is the blue PDF here. So now we get a very nice and narrow PDF, and if we were only looking at this PDF, we'd say, oh, you know, well done, we have a small uh, uh, error on the, on the uh, result, and so the, the value must lie somewhere here, but we would miss the point that the PDF is completely offset from the true value. And so if there is spin uh, present in your signal, um, uh, you should be looking for it. If you, uh, you know, don't allow for it, uh, you're going to bias your other parameters as well. No, no. So I mean, the the sorry for the, uh, for the red one. Yes. The red one. Yes. I, I I yeah. I I don't I don't show the spin parameters here because they're not present for the blue signal, and so they're not very interesting no, 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 for a comparison. Right. Yes. So so for the red, we we have 15. We allow for 15 parameters. We vary 15 parameters. In this case, we vary only nine. Um. Okay. Very briefly. Uh, so it's important to allow for spin. It's also a nuisance to have spins. Um, here you see what happens if we inject a signal without spins. Uh, so now the, the, the signal itself doesn't carry any spin, uh, but we still allow the code to find for spin. You'd see if we, if we would have a non-spinning template to do the parameter estimation, we'd probably get a much better uh, accuracy here because we're restricted to this line down here uh, than we get now because now uh, the spin is allowed to go all kinds of ways and as the spin is allowed to change you, uh, the chirp mass is allowed to change as well so not only uh, do we get so, so in the end leaving the spin free letting the sp spin vary in this uh, estimation also allows the, the chirp mass to vary a little bit more and that's exactly what we saw in the results um, this is uh, similar, but in this case, um, the, the injection does contain spin, so this is the position where we did the injection, spin of 0.9, chirp mass of uh, 7.6 or so. Um, and in this case, we did a spinning injection, and we allow uh, spins to, to be uh, estimated as well, so this is the full thing. Um, and now you see that uh, because spin is allowed to vary, uh, the chirp mass can vary with it, right? So if you misinterpret uh, the spin parameter, you're also allowed to vary the chirp mass parameter. And so there's this sort of uh, correlation. It doesn't look very strong here, but it's partly because of the automatic scale of this, uh, of this plot, if you would restrict the plot to this bit, you see there is some correlation between the spin and the chirp mass. And the fact, uh, and, and the fact that spin is present basically means that this solution is almost as good as this solution. And it's, it's very hard to tell which one uh, is the right one. Um, let me actually just skip this and uh, summarize the results uh, later on. So a few things that I didn't mention uh, that, we, that we're doing uh, is, for example, the Ninja project. I think Duncan Brown told about it. It's basically bringing uh, numerical rel relativists and uh, data analysis people together. Uh, they have a cool little logo as well. So this stands for uh, numerical injection um, analysis, data analysis, something like that. Uh, the problem at the moment for us is that they use very high mass waveforms, whereas we have an in-spiral template only. And uh, so what our code tries to do is fit the in-spiral uh, of our templates to the ring merger and ring down of the numerical uh, waveforms. And the result is that the spin actually helps the chirp mass. We can't get a high enough chirp mass. And so the spin goes to maximum value as well to compensate for that. So we get very strange results. The only thing we actually get right at the moment is the, uh, the sky position. So clearly, we can't do high, uh, high, mass in, high mass waveforms at the moment. We have to work on that. 
but at least we're aware of it. Um, uh, this is basically the point I told you before. We, we are testing on LIGO data. It's very hard to, to publish results, so uh, if we don't have to, we, we don't. Um, and, and basically what we see is that if we do it, we find more or less the same results, but usually the accuracy is slightly lower, and especially if the SNR is really low, about six uh, per detector or something, uh, then the accuracy makes a big difference. Lastly, um, I said we want to automate this, and in fact, Spin Spiral, our code is at the moment in the uh, LIGO follow-up pipeline, uh, which means that anybody who thinks he finds something interesting can uh, say me automatically, I think you have to set a flag or something, uh, tell the code, tell the, the pipeline to also launch our code and do more in, uh, investigation on the signal, on the candidate event. Um, and so at the moment we're doing, uh, and by you know, we, I mean uh, a couple of students at Northwestern, are doing follow-up of all kinds of interesting candidates, like the loudest uh, 10 or 15 candidates per month, uh, known hardware injections, uh, and, and many other interesting uh, events. So conclusions, we wrote this code, it can do a parameter estimation, I won't bother you with that again. Um, typical accuracies, this is for a black hole neutron star, uh, so mass ratio of 0.14, SNR about 17. Uh, this lists so, sort of the typical um, accuracies that we find. Mass is about 30 to 40 percent. Spin gets a lot better if there's more spin present, as I showed you before. Um, the sky position also gets a lot better uh, if there's high spin, because we shrink the arcs on the sky. Um, same holds for binary orientation. And the time of coalescence is, well, you know, uh, it's going to be less than 40 milliseconds anyway, because it's the diameter of the Earth. So um, it's not that important. Same for the black hole. Black hole signals that we just looked at, I told you the very new results, so there are many things that I need to figure out exactly why they're there and how it works. Uh, I suspect part of it has to do with uh, uh, a less deep mass ratio, um, with the reason that if you have a very strong mass ratio, uh, and in the case of a, a black hole neutron star uh, uh, signal that is the case, plus you only have one spin because you can neglect the neutron star spin, then all the spin is in the most massive object, and so things are less confusing than, the, than, they, than they probably are here, where the mass ratio is more equal, and um, the, the, co the, the, the likelihoods of uh, you know, certain mass and spin combinations can be very similar. That means our results are surprisingly not as good as in the, in the first exercise. Um, Distance is not too bad. If there's some spin present, this, the, the sky position is not worse either, uh, and so uh, is the timing. And so despite the fact that, uh, you know, the, the, the determination of sky position, for example, uh, compared to this, I suppose this is a blob of about five degrees or so, is, is rather poor, or four degrees, rather poor uh, compared to typical EM accuracy, clearly. Um, you know, the combinations uh, of these effects uh, of, sorry, of these parameters, uh, you, you also get a disk, you, you get some handle on the disk, you get the sky position to some extent, you know exactly when uh, an in-spiral happened, uh, but a bit of luck, it actually helps us to uh, connect, let's say, a gamma ray burst with one of these gravitational wave events. Um, and as I showed you before, uh, including spin uh, is useful, uh, but it's also a nuisance. It makes things a lot harder. So let me stop at the end. <laughs>